I'm going to be letting you guys into a small bit of my personal life this morning. Uh, I, I always wonder what people think, the youth ministers or uh, preachers that preach on Sunday morning, what they do if they have a normal life outside of church. Um, there's been numerous times that I've gotten called at like 8 p.m. on a Saturday night, and, and it goes like this. It goes, hey, hey, are you up at the church? And I go, no, I'm watching Netflix and eating popcorn in my underwear. Like, is that what you're supposed to do on Saturday night, right? And, uh, you know, we're allowed to have a normal human life. But I'm going to let you guys in a little bit to my world, something that you're going to think it's ridiculous, I'm a little bit passionate about, but I'm going to explain to you a little bit where it came from and what it is. Uh, where it came from was 14 years ago, my wife and I found out that we would be having our third child, my daughter, and uh, one of the first, uh, well, there were two things that made me panic. My two older kids are boys. I thought, what are you supposed to do with a girl? How do you do this? I, I thought that, and then closely behind us, like, okay, another kid. I have to find a way to pay for this kid to be born. So my solution, it came at perfect timing where UPS was hiring seasonal. And mentally, I go, I'm going to get on there. I'm going to work hard. They'll keep me past seasonal. Uh, that'll help me pay for my daughter to be born. Long story short, I spent 12 months of my life uh, preloading, and I'm convinced that I lost two years of my life because of that, because of the type of work it was. It was incredible. But anyways, I discovered coffee. Because when you go to work at 3 a.m., 2 o'clock in the afternoon feels different because my cycle would look like this. I'd be up at 3 uh, go to work at UPS, come to work at the church. Uh, man, about 2, 3 o'clock gets here, and I was just doing this. You know, that whole panic, like, how long have I been asleep? And then you look down, and it's like, okay, good, it's only been five minutes. So I walk in to the room over here, and we had one of those lovely bun o -matics. Anybody remember bun o -matics? Right? Those, there was never a clean carafe with a bun matic Yeah, someone, someone actually knows what I'm talking about, like the crusty brown old things that are always associated with that. I remember standing in front of that machine, and uh, the pot was there, and the, the oil skim that was on top of the coffee, you guys know that? Ever seen that on, like at a gas station when you know that coffee's been there for like eight hours? Uh, I will tell you this, we, we are honoring Scott Jones for 25 years next week, but in 25 years, the man never learned how to make coffee through that bun I will tell you that. And he, hopefully, hopefully he's at church somewhere else and he didn't hear me say that because he'll, no, he won't be mad. But anyways, so this is my first experience with coffee. I poured it in a cup, tasted it, tastes like garbage. And so I took some of that white powdery stuff, right? No one knows what that stuff is put enough in there that it looked like I had chocolate milk, you know, and then I drank it and I was like, good, make it through to five o'clock, I'm going to head home. Um, that was my, my gateway into coffee. Now from there, I developed a really like just, it has been a wonderful but awful adventure with coffee because I always had this mindset, people drink this so it's got to get better. So step two was a Keurig. Uh, I was like, I had like a first gen Keurig because I was like, well, this should be good coffee. It's like custom. It's going to come in this little pod and it turned everybody into baristas because they get up in the morning, rub their eyes, put a pod in, slam it shut, push a button, all of a sudden, all of a sudden you're a barista. Uh, but then I go, okay, the pods are too expensive. Uh, I started getting the custom pod where you could put your own grounds in, and I thought I was really fancy then. And then I started buying my own beans to grind in a blade grinder to put in the coffee pod because uh, I, I thought that would be even less expensive yet. And so as I'm progressing, I had an earth-shaking uh, experience over Thanksgiving one year. I was up at my wife's family's house, and my, my, my brother-in-law brings me this cup of coffee almost as if he was holding a child and goes, here, try this. <laughs> and I, I went like this, and I was like, well, I'll have coffee. There's no milk or anything in here, but I'll... He goes, just try it. And I, I was like, coffee can be good. Turns out he made that cup of coffee in a Chemex. I don't know. Any of you guys familiar with Chemex? Anyone? Yep, got a few people. You guys are slowly, you're like, I don't want anybody to know, but I do coffee weird that way too. So this was like, you put a paper filter in here and you put fresh grounds and you pour coffee, you make a wonderful cup of coffee. This is a great apparatus for us to use. I, I went from that, uh, having that at my, my in-law's house, to um, an AeroPress. Anybody familiar with an AeroPress? 
Yeah, see, all these people that, that are later in the afternoon, you guys are my coffee drinkers. These are my people. Uh, everyone else like, just kind of looked and like, what the heck is that? This is actually made by the people that make the aerobi disc. You take this little basket off, you put a paper filter in here, you screw it on there, you take the plunger out, you put your grounds in, you put your water in, and then you, this will look like a lot of work, then you press the coffee through. Ugh. But you would do it like this, because if you did it like this, it'd just drip all everywhere. So you push down like that, make a really good cup of coffee out of the AeroPress. This is still one that I keep around. Now, after this, I felt the need, see I brought almost all my toys. I felt the need to get a better, I wanted actual espresso. Look at this, look at this thing, is that like Frankenstein or what? Right? Any of you have a, any of you have a clue what this thing is? Anybody know? It's called a rock espresso machine. Yeah, Brittany's raising her hand. She has one on her kitchen counter. Uh, yeah, you got called out. Sorry. Shouldn't do that again. That's a bad rule of thumb of preaching. So the way this works is you have a porta filter, like they have at coffee shops. You fill with grounds, put it in, you close it up, you put the water in, you raise the arms, and it allows the water to get into the chamber, and then you get to flex on your coffee. You go, so, like, Brittany gets to see Ransom flexing his muscles in the morning over the counter, just getting, getting all hulk on that thing. So, from this, you can have an Americano, you could have a flat white, you could have a, a latte. There's lots of things that you could do coffee with this guy. This was an earth changer, but along with this, I had to get a new grinder. You see how the dollar signs are adding up, right? Uh, so much for paying for my daughter to be born because all, all the toys that I have. But this was, this was 14 years ago. Uh, had to get a new grinder because you needed a consistent grind to make this happen. And then the last two toys that I got, well, I'm going to call them the last two. My wife would probably debate with you. I did full, I came full circle. This is what I have at my, in my house now. This is called a V60. It's a Japanese pour over method where you put a tiny little filter in here. You grind some grounds. You put 16 grams of coffee into your V60 with 256 grams of water, and it should take you three to three and a half minutes to brew the perfect cup of coffee. Now, uh, you think I'm kidding. I have a scale that I will use, so I'll know exactly how many grounds I'm putting in, how much water I'm putting in. Way too much work going into a cup of coffee. Are you exhausted yet? I'm not, because this is fun for me. I'm going to tell you the last thing that I got and it was bought for me by my friends, was this wonderful little cup that is called an ember. Now, this truly was world changing. Because how many of you, now, not many of you get into the nerdy level of what I've got going on here, but how many of you do enjoy a cup of coffee, right? Every now and again, yeah, lots of hands, good. You know how you get down to the bottom, like, drink and a half, and it's like colder than room temperature, and you go like this? and you want to just chuck it, here's where the ember steps in. So I will take my V60, I will make my coffee directly into my ember. I will set my ember to hold my coffee at 122 degrees Fahrenheit, and it will keep my coffee at that temperature for one hour so that I can thoroughly enjoy my cup of coffee. So, and of course, I can adjust the temperature of my coffee with what? My phone, absolutely. I can sit there and decide. This is the dumbest thing on earth, you guys. My coffee mug has firmware, like your computer. My coffee mug has firmware, like my computer. But, uh, but this truly was, like, this was an adventure that I've, that I've been on out for the last 14 years. Started with the dirty bun and I was thinking to myself as I was preparing this message, because we're in the midst of this legacy series, if I died today, how sad would it be if all that was left of my legacy was the guy liked a good cup of coffee? You know? Like, so it's really shallow to think about, but it, that is actually a question that will keep people awake at night, is how will I be remembered beyond this life? How will I be remembered by my family members? How will I be remembered by my coworkers? Uh, I, so people work and work and work to build a reputation, to build status, to build achievement, to build success, because they are so concerned about the legacy that they are leaving. And I'm telling you that 
if I died today and all that I was remembered for was that, man, the guy knew how to get around a good cup of coffee. He knew the difference between natural processed beans and washed beans and raisin processed beans and honey processed coffee beans. And you guys are sitting here going, what? That would be a sad story. And I would agree with you. Because it would mean that I truly never grew up as an individual. I never truly stepped into who I was and understanding why I was here. Because that's what happens with entertainers, politicians, athletes, uh, CEOs that get caught up in scandals, abuse, uh, addiction, uh, self-indulgent lifestyles. It's all because they truly don't understand who they are and why they're here. Because those two questions, who we are and why we are here, are at the core of working through the, the, the issue of legacy. It's like the core tension. It's where the, the conflict and the problem solving of what someone's legacy is, is when you answer the question of who are you and why are you here? And we're going to look this morning at the life of Samson. Samson was a was a man in Scripture that, that, that made a ton of mistakes. And something I love about Scripture is it doesn't edit out the idiots. Like, when you look at Scripture, if there was an idiot in Scripture, it didn't get edited out to save face and to go, well, we can't let people know that people make mistakes or, or that there's, there's, there's people in, in Scripture that, that are less than perfect. They leave them right smack in there, and Samson is no exception. Samson, uh, Samson was, uh, was born to a, a man and a woman in somewhat of a miraculous manner, not in the way that necessarily identically the way that Jesus was, but there was an angel that appeared to the woman. She hadn't had any children. She had been barren her entire life, and he said, you're going to have a child. Your child's going to be set apart. Your child is going to, you're going to raise your child differently than everyone else has raised their children. And this is why. It's because God is going to use your child to deliver his people from bondage. Because the nation of Israel, God's people, it was a, it was a tribe of people, were, were enslaved to this nation of Philistines, this other people group. And God was going to use Samson to deliver the Israelites from their captors. But he was to be raised different. He was to be raised, in, uh, he was to have a Nazarite vow is what it was called. It meant that he ate certain, didn't eat certain things, didn't drink certain things, didn't touch dead stuff. Uh, and in addition to that, which every little boy would have appreciated, never to sit in a barber's chair. He was never to have his hair cut. So you just like picture this wild mangy looking kid like getting grown up with just crazy hair braids and all that crazy stuff going on. Uh, that was Samson. And God set him apart and God gave him unique gifts. And it wasn't the first time that God gave judges unique gifts. He gave some judges wisdom. He gave some judges leadership. To Samson, he gave supernatural strength. And if you have time and you want to dig into the Word of God, you look at Judges 13, 14, 15, and 16, it outlines the story of Samson, and it tells you in detail his folly, his failures, time after time after time, and it was because of this, Samson constantly struggled with who he was and why he was there. I, th I think there's numerous reasons for it. It doesn't say anything about his upbringing, but Samson was constantly alone. He never found himself with people. He never surrounded himself with a community of men to, to help remind him of who he was. He was always making the same mistake over and over and over again, and it would bring shame to him. He would get angry. He would react in rage, and he would bring hurt uh, to, the to the Philistine nation. Now, God intended judgment to come to that nation. So that, that, that judgment was coming through Samson. But something that I wonder, I wonder if that judgment would have come differently or if it would have had a different impact on Samson and his family around him if Samson had really choose, chosen to grow up and to know who he was and why he was here. 
I wonder what kind of impact that would have had on the outcome because the same thing would have happened. God still used this fool, Samson, that couldn't stay out of the beds of different women, and it destroyed him. He was constantly manipulated by them, and I'm telling you, his pride, people around him played played the heartstrings of his pride like it was a cheap guitar, and he would get enraged and just come unglued on people because he had completely forgotten who he was and why he was there. The end of Samson's story you can see in Judges 16. At this point, he had been betrayed by a third, a third woman in his life, uh, and he had had his eyes gouged out. He had been a captive to the, to the Philistine nation, and he had been in prison. And uh, they were, this nation was out celebrating, and they were like, hey, we're in a good mood. Bring Samson out so we can mock him, because he said he was going to judge us. He was going to bring destruction to us. He was going to destroy us. Bring him out here so we can spit on him, call him names, all of these things. And here's what happened. When, uh, when they stood among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who had held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so I may lean against them. Now, the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. It was a who's who, military leaders, political leaders. There was over 3,000 men and women there watching and mocking Samson. So Samson said this. Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, remember me. O oh God, please strengthen me just one more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Even at the end of his life, still he was wanting revenge. He was still wanting revenge. And so what Samson did at that point, they placed him between these two pillars. And architecturally, these pillars would have supported what would have looked like somewhat of a stone balcony. And underneath, there would have been a, uh, like a common place that would have been flooded with people. There would have been people on top of that balcony. He pushed these pillars out. Everything came crashing down, death and destruction. And that's where Samson's life headed. And that's where Samson's legacy ends. Self-promotion, destruction, because he didn't remind himself of who he was, that he was set apart by God, and why he was there to bring deliverance from bondage for God's people. Now, in contrast to that, we have the life of Jesus. In the same way, Jesus' birth was miraculous. Angel appears to Mary, says, you're going you're gonna to have a son, you're going to name him this, he is going to be the savior of the world. So Samson was to save a nation. Jesus was to save humanity. And here's the thing. Jesus never once struggled with his identity. He never once questioned who he was. The grow-up moment, he knew exactly who he was. He knew exactly why he was here. He, go, he knew that he was the one son of the one true God and that he was here to point all of humanity back to the king, back to his father. And that was his sole purpose. And because he knew that and he owned that, it was reflected through his entire life. So picture Samson. All Samson had was physical strength. Jesus had, Jesus being God had the, the tap, he could have tapped the resource of being the God of the universe as he existed on earth, and he could have used that to exact whatever judgment he wanted at any time. But when we read Scripture, when we read specifically the book of John, we see a tender-hearted God that had become man interacting with prostitutes, crippled people, people with deathly disease, the outcasts of society, tax collectors, the ones that have been pushed away not to be t spoken to again. He talked to the lowest of the lows, and he spoke life into them because he understood who he was and he understood why he was here. That as the son of the one true God, I am here only to point all of creation, back to my Father. We see a beautiful picture of this in Matthew 26. If you have your Bibles and you want to open this up, 
This in my, in my mind, this is Jesus faced with a, a grow-up moment one more time. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's just hours before he's going to be arrested. It's hours before he's going to be beaten. It's just hours before he is going to be wrongfully tried and lied about and then ultimately crucified and mocked on a cross. It's just hours before that happens. Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And then from that moment, he took some of his closest friends. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, my soul is overwhelmed and it, with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground. And listen to how he prayed. This is him praying to God, Father, if it is possible, may this cup, the crucifixion that he was getting ready to face, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. You see him addressing, his, addressing God as Father. You see him addressing why he's here. He returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, and I want you to listen closely. He said, my father, now this word translated from the Hebrew, in other books it's translated as, as Abba, which is the way that a young child would look at their father and go, Daddy, Daddy, can you hear me? Like any of us that have been fathers or any of us that have had a father, when you cry out the name of your dad, their ears turn. When my children use the word daddy, even being 18, 16, and 13, it grabs my attention like this. My head turns. My focus changes. When Jesus uses that term Abba, it communicates intimacy. It communicates he feels safe in the presence of his father. He knew exactly who he was. Jesus had no doubt. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. He said, you know what? I know why I'm here, and I'm ready. So what if you stepped into that legacy, Jesus' legacy right there? His legacy was understanding he's the one child of the one true God, whole purpose to point all of humanity back to the cross. What if you stepped into that exact legacy as an individual? You would miss nothing. You would miss the stress of building status. You would miss the stress of, of building a business. Maybe you would miss the stress of, of bank accounts. Maybe you would miss the stress of drama. Man, if you miss those things, I feel sorry for you because I want life to be simple. And when you step into the legacy of Jesus Christ and you go, I'm uniting my life with him. I'm with that guy. I want to be considered co-heirs with him. I want to be considered his, uh, a, a child of God in the same manner that he is. I want to be about his father's legacy. When you say that, it's like putting a new pair of glasses on when your prescriptions change. You see the world differently. You would miss nothing. You would miss nothing about your old life. So what about Jesus' legacy? The church, crazy thing about his legacy, he left it in the hands of some men on top of a mountain when Jesus left to be with his father uh, from this earth. He left the purpose of the church in their hands, the same people that ran and panicked and hid when Jesus was crucified, he left his legacy in their hands to carry forward. And guess what? You are living examples of that legacy because you are sitting here this morning hearing Christ crucified, 
that message was made because those individuals understood who they were, children of the one true God. And they understood why they are here to point all of humanity towards God. And look at what they've done. Another man named Paul made it his purpose to plant churches all around the Mediterranean and set up the network for the church to go forward in a similar manner of how we hope to launch an effective kingdom-building church in Broken Bow. And we read about this in Titus because Paul would write letters to these churches, and Titus was the preacher. The location was Crete. And this is what Paul was saying to Crete. He was talking to him about establishing leadership. He was talking to him about getting all of these things done. And then in chapter 2, he says, You must teach what is, an account, what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train younger women to love their husbands husbands and children. He goes on and on to talk about how they should live and how younger men should live and how people should be loyal employees that are honorable uh, to their employers for the sake of Jesus' legacy, the church. So the first question is this. Will you step into Jesus' legacy as an individual? Will we step into as a group into the legacy of the church? Will we as a corporate body remember who we are? Love Unlimited. Will we remember why we are here? To worship the one true God. To serve Him with our lives. And to grow as followers of Him. Will we commit to that legacy? We're going to step into this moment of communion now. And it's a time of intimacy with your Father God. As a follower of Christ, you are His child. And when you pick up the bread and you pick up the cup, Scripture says it's in that moment that we remember who Jesus was and why He is here. And when you take it, you're saying, I'm with him. Let's pray. Father, I pray for this moment of worship together as we commune as a body of believers with you. Father, your legacy is beautiful. And we at times feel as if we are not worthy to carry that legacy. But Father, through the strength and power of the Holy Spirit, we can and we will. Help us to be courageous. Amen. You know, I hope, I hope that when I, when I die and I'm gone, I hope there is more to my legacy than a cup of coffee. I, I truly do. Um, and, and I hope that you understand something, that there is, there is no estate that you will leave your family. There is no business that you will build big enough. There is no reputation that you've stood upon long enough. There's, there's not going to be a place in, in heaven for the accolades of man, like recognition from men. They're not going to line the walls with your trophies and your certificates. None of those legacies will last beyond here. You have to hear me. There is only Christ and Him crucified. Will you join Him?